services. I want to welcome you and all those who out there are streaming with us this morning. <laughs> Happy Mother's Day to all of you who are mothers, and uh, we're here to uh, say thank you. Um, we'll get to that other th in just a moment, but as we begin our service, so let me invite you to turn to Psalm 32 with me. There's a couple of verses here I'd like to read this morning as we begin our service. Psalm 32. Let me invite you to stand with me in honor of the word of God this morning. What's the matter, honey? Oh, she doesn't want to be in the picture. Would you like me to move that chair over there? <laughs> Honey. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Psalm 32. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 for us, and then I'll go to prayer. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, this morning we come into your presence as the body of Christ, those who have been drawn by your spirit, saved and sealed, waiting for our redemption to be completed in Christ. What a glorious day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Lord, I think the grandest thing when I get there will be there will be no sin to contend with and I'll be able to have full fellowship with you, your Son, and the Spirit. Until then, though, Lord, we live in a world that is constantly drawing our hearts away from you in various ways through the radio, TV, other means. Lord, the world is constantly tugging on my flesh. And it is so good to know that there is a Savior who died for me and to know him personally. It is so glorious to come to church on Sundays where the people of God have gathered themselves together to exalt and praise the one that has blessed them by removing our transgressions. I thank you that the blood of Christ has not just covered our sins, but has removed the stain of every sin of our lives. We are truly blessed this morning because you've imputed to us the righteousness of Christ because we're trusting in, clinging to, and relying upon him. And thus the church gathers this morning to praise you and worship you and you alone for your great plan to save us through your glorious son, Jesus, and to seal us by the power of your spirit. Oh God, thank you for allowing us to be present today in church with God's people. Help us as we seek to worship you this morning. Help us as we seek to use our spiritual gifts, gifts to bless one another as we fellowship. And Lord, when we're finished with this morning's service, I pray that it, we would all be able to say it has been good to be in the house of God. To this end, we ask, fill us with your spirit. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There's a couple of things I want to make mention of by way of announcements as we uh, begin our service this morning. We want you to continue to be praying for Ron Howard's sister, Donna, it is not looking good for Donna in terms for this world. At least that's the last word that we have gotten. Uh, they did the surgery or at least attempted to do the surgery and realized they had to take out all the rods and all the equipment that they had put into her months ago. And uh, 
my question was, well, what is she going to do now? Because those are the things that we're holding her up straight, and I have no idea. So I, uh, at this point, uh, as you will note at the bottom of your bulletin, if you open it up, there, there is, the doctor said there's nothing more they can do for Donna. So I, I think that probably my guess is the best thing we can do is pray that the Lord would quietly and tenderly take her home. And in the meantime, we ask that you'd pray for Donna and Ron and uh, uh, Ron's other uh, sister, Shirley, as uh, the three of them are left. Their mother had gone to be with the Lord several years ago. Father had gone to be with the Lord many, many years ago. So it's just the three of them. And uh, Donna has, she never did have any children, but uh, so her, um, her family really is, uh, you know, uh, concealed in that relationship between her brother and sister. And so it's a, it's a precious thing that they have. So we need to be keep praying for them. Uh, next thing that I want to just remind you of is a retreat for the ladies who are going to uh, Mount Gilead. And you'll note that... Uh, we were, uh, there's a request in there that anyone who's planning on going would meet after the service today and then maybe arrange some rides and those sorts of things because uh, some people are going up for three days, some are going for two, some are going just for one day and maybe it'd be nice if you guys could ride together but we're going to postpone that till next week so next week we'll take and organize those rides and stuff and that'll be the week before um, the retreat. Uh, this is the last week for photos, so if you haven't got your photo taken for the uh, the directory, please get that done. And um, let's see, the last thing I'll mention to you, at least out of the bulletin, is uh, the Center for Hope, or NorCal Ministries, is going to be having uh, their event on uh, Sunday, May 16th, which is next Sunday. So um, we went through that last week, want to make sure that you... Um, uh, participate in that if you can. And then uh, on the back of the bulletin, you'll note uh, just a thought or two from Marla. And I want to encourage you to keep reading those. She just does a wonderful, wonderful job on those things. Now, I'm going to let you know something that I normally don't let you know, but I'm going to let you know. <clears throat> and, and there's a reason why. Um, next week, I'm going to be gone. And so next Sunday, I'll be uh, either traveling or still in Southern California, not sure yet. But I'm going down, uh, Connie and I are going down Thursday and uh, going to see some friends on the way down. And then we're, uh, while we're, uh, get to, when we get to S Southern California, we'll stay with some friends and, um, and just enjoy some good fellowship with uh, old friends. The people that we're going to be seeing in Southern California, I've been friends with the gentleman since the fifth grade. We moved in next door to one another, and we've been best friends all through our life. Our kids call them uncle and aunt. Uh, their kids still call me Uncle Dan and, and uh, calls Connie Aunt Connie. So uh, it's going to be a good time to see them. haven't seen them in quite a long time. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is is because um, some of you just in inevitably get word that I'm gone. And sometimes when that happens, the pastor leaves people uh, decide, well, I'll take a Sunday off too from church because I, I don't want to go. And I just want you to know, I'm going to be asking who is here. <laughs> and uh, if I find out, I'm going to be praying against you. <laughs> but I want you to be present next week because the church needs everybody here because all of us are precious to one another. Uh, David Dick will be with us. So I'm going to ask you to be praying for David this next week. He's in Alaska right now with his family vacationing. And uh, they'll be back uh, the 13th. So, and then they're gonna, he's going to be here. I hope the family comes. But uh, he'll be here the, um, the 16th. And so it would be good to have David here. He's always such a prize um, and a gift to the church when he comes to be with us. And uh, those of you who don't know David... Uh, David spiritually grew up in this church, and then by God's grace, he is now, uh, he uh, administers and is the, what's his official title? I'm trying to think, um, camp director for Heartstone Bible Camp. Yeah. And so um, the camp is doing some new things this year, and it's exciting to see under David's leadership where the camp has gone over the last 
several years. And so um, I want you to come and support Dave and, um, and be a part of what God's doing here next Sunday. So just remember, I'll be asking. <laughs> How do you like the flowers up front? I feel like I'm just in the way of all of this. You know, it's like, this is just so beautiful. Yeah, I really appreciate the ladies doing this for me. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, under, I see, I'm not supposed to mention her name, but the um, lady sitting over there, um, under her leadership, there were several other ladies, like a lady over here, and I don't know who else. Who else helped you with it? Uh, Jenny. Oh, Jenny and Jessica came in, yeah. And um, so I appreciate all those that uh, put these together in honor of our mothers uh, this morning, Mother's Day. And so after the service is over, we want to encourage all the moms to come up and grab one of these baskets, take it home. It is an edible uh, thing as well as uh, beauty, so there's uh, some fruit in there that you can enjoy, and um, you get a double uh, blessing. You get to enjoy the, the flowers, and you get to eat the fruit inside. So I want to thank, um, thank those who put that together. I found a couple of things for Mother's Day. I thought it were, was appropriate, and uh, one of them comes out of this little book I have. It's, um, it's called uh, The Throne and the Footstool. And it is a set of poems that was written by a lady who was a pastor's wife in a little town in Wyoming. When I say little, I'm talking about uh, before you can take a breath, you're in and out of the town. It's that small, a couple hundred people. And uh, her husband was an amazing pastor. In fact, he's one of the reasons I ended up going to Frontier School of the Bible. He was at that time retired teaching there. And uh, his heart uh, for shepherding and the word and such on a visit that uh, Connie and I and the kids uh, made back to uh, LaGrange years ago, uh, we met him. I spent a little time with him, and he had a tremendous influence in terms of me going to Frontier. But his wife was a precious woman. She was a very quiet lady. Um, this was cowboy country in the days that they really ministered in Wyoming. You go to Wyoming today, like Cheyenne, for instance, you'll, you'll get the cowboy flavor, but essentially when you go to these cities across the United States now, they all kind of look and smell the same and same kind of restaurants and that sort of thing. But in the day that they ministered in that area, it was really cowboy country, and they came from Michigan. And so it was a new environment. They were almost like missionaries uh, in this little town. And anyway, one of the things that God gifted... Uh, Betty Jo with was the ability to, to write poems. And uh, she's got some of these just clever little poems that she put in here. One's called uh, My, My Glory Crown. Um, and it goes like this. Boy, Mom, you sure are getting gray. My crown-up kids are wanting to say. I can't deny their candid view. But change that gray, I shall not do. Gray hairs, my Lord does not disdain. For in his word he makes it plain that a hoary hair's a glory crown. So I'll not tint it back to brown. <laughs> Each hair of white I've fairly won. Tis nothing some beautician's done. The, dress and stra the stress and strain of motherhood, the battles fought, the foes withstood. The midnight cries for loving care, the childhood woes to heal and share, the teenage adore freely spent. Fool's hill that can't be circumvent. All these have turned my hair to gray, I'd have it not another way. My hair of gray shall not be spurned, for it's a birthright that I have earned. <laughs> I like that. I also came across something Chuck Swindoll wrote, which I thought was really good. And um, what he did is he made a list of IOUs to his mother. And it goes like this. As I walk through my museum of memories... I owe you for your time, day and night. I owe you for your example, 
consistent and dependable. I owe you for your support, stimulating and challenging. I owe you for your humor, sparky and quick. I owe you for your counsel, wise and quiet. I owe you for your humility, genuine and gracious. I owe you for your hospitality, smiling and warm. I owe you for your insight, keen and honest. I owe you for your flexibility, patient and joyful. I owe you for your sacrifice, numerous and quickly forgotten. I owe you for your faith, solid and sure. I owe you for your hope, ceaseless and indestructible. I owe you for your love, devoted and deep. I thought that was really good. As um, I thought about these things, I have to tell you that um, many of the things that I was looking at for Mother's Day in terms of how people would poetically or some artistic way talk about motherhood, I have to tell you that in the culture that we live in today, I find it difficult to see in this culture how those things are being promoted across our land. And the only place that I know in the United States of America today where motherhood is really, or at least should be taught and promoted properly, is in the church. You can see why, it's, why it is so important for mothers to bring their children to church. Why it's so important for people who didn't have those kinds of mothers. And there's a lot of them amongst us. There are some that might say, you know, I don't really like Mother's Day because all the things you read in cards, I can't get one of those cards for my mom because she wasn't one of those kind. Where's that person supposed to find the example of motherhood? Well, I not only suggest, but I say it is the church. The church. I thank God for my home church where we had wonderful examples of motherhood from the pastor's wife on down through the church there were many many women who took up that that mantle and um, and really stood as outstanding examples of motherhood particularly to Connie as um, we were just starting our lives together in Christ and just starting our family to have those kinds of relationships are precious. And so I thank God for the church, and I thank God for you women who are here today who have put your time in. And I hope that you are now benefiting some of, uh, of that um, or reaping some rewards from that in your relationships with your children. I know we are. I know Connie is. And I, as your pastor, want to tell you women who have sought to be godly mothers, thank you. Thank you for giving our church examples of what biblical motherhood is. You are precious to us and to God. Let me pray. Let me pray for you. Father in heaven this morning, just the thought of calling you Father automatically reminds me that there's a mother. I thank you that in the wisdom of creating man, you created man and woman, that they would have children and there would be fatherhood and motherhood. 
I thank you for the word of God that teaches us what a biblical mother ought to be and what she shouldn't be. I thank you for this roadmap of life. And oh, Father, I thank you for those women who have taken up the word of God and sought to model their lives around the scriptures and what it says about motherhood. In my mind's eye, I see the women in our church right now, starting with my own wife and so many others who are sitting in this room and others who can't be present here but are streaming, who I know have sought to live the life of a biblical mother, a woman who modeled Jesus to her children. And I thank you for those that you've placed into the Ukiah Bible Church. Oh God, I pray that today, as we are mindful of their role in life, that they would have a sense of blessing. And that this day, you might bless them with children that call them, husbands that speak publicly of them, and their faithfulness to the highest call of womanhood to be a life bearer. Oh God, thank you for these women. As we live in a culture today, Lord, that attacks motherhood on so many angles, I ask that you would be a hedge about them and protect them Keep them, O oh God, on the course that you've set for them. For those, Lord, that are in the later years of life, I pray that you would bring about sweet memories of their children today and sweet memories of being a mother to a newborn baby. Holding that one in your arms, the memories of caring for those toddlers, the difficulty of mothering a teen. Lord, and for those who find themselves today with adult children, they're at a different stage in life. I pray for them that they might have really great relationships with their children. That there would be open doors and hearts that are open to one another. Father, I pray this morning for those mothers like my daughter who's brand new at it and seeking to be faithful in raising their children in the fear and admonition of the Lord, it is not easy today. Life is so changed in the, in the 40 years since we've had children. And we find today that the state wants to be the father and the mother of the children. Oh God, I pray that you would give, that you would give a sense to these mothers of what it means to live in this day and to mother their children properly. Give them a heart that says, I won't give my child over to anybody to raise. That's my responsibility. Women who would cherish it and put all else aside to care for their children so that there might be a new generation of Christians that would come forward in a day of darkness. Oh God, 
So much of life depends on mothers knowing what their role is and their responsibility before you. Help us in our church to do whatever we can to support these mothers and love them and to make their job easier. Thank you for blessing us with these dear women. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me invite you to open your Bibles to uh, the book of Ephesians. I can hear some of you say, Ephesians? I thought we were in Genesis. Well, I'm going to get there. You turn to Ephesians with me, chapter 3. And I want to read uh, the first 11 verses in chapter 3 with you, so I'm going to invite you to stand with me, and this is going to be used as sort of a, a springboard to get back into Genesis 24, and you'll see how that goes as we progress through this. Genesis, or pardon me, Ephesians chapter 3, starting at verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles... If indeed you have heard of the fellowship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief. And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and, and prophets in the Spirit. To be specific, that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power. To me, the very least of all saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things in order that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. This was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Join me in prayer. Father, as we this morning begin to... Uh, look at chapter 24 of Genesis in a new light, I ask that the Holy Spirit would help me to be able to present these things that are there in the scriptures in a way that makes sense. So I, I need you this morning to energize me with the gift of preaching and teaching. Lord, I, I need you to move in the body of Christ and that you would energize their minds so that they aren't distracted with the cares of life, with phones going off, with the next thing that needs to be done today, the phone calls that probably have to be made, and just the chores that normally need to be done. All those things can be distracting to us, let alone the relationships we have with people and just things that are going on in interpersonal lives. Lord, Will you quicken the mind of all those who are here and listening through the streaming to the teaching this morning? For you are going to present here something that is astounding. And it helps us to see into the depth of your mind and heart for humanity, particularly the church. And so guide us and direct us in this. Move in us 
so that, Lord, when we're finished, we might have a, a greater sense of faith in your word and that we might be sec more secure in your love as we discover that you have been loving us before the foundation of the world. You are an awesome God. Reveal yourself to us this morning through Genesis 24. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. You know, you're sitting there thinking to yourself, okay, you're going to go to Genesis 24. Why did we start in Ephesians 3? Well, there's a good reason for this. Um, Paul speaks here of a mystery in this third chapter. And um, the mystery is the church. For all the thousands of years that God has been bringing forth um, his word through the prophets, through the Old Testament, through Moses, God has had his eye on a particular people. And that people are those in the church, the church age. Uh, Stephen, can you put up, uh, oh, I shouldn't do that because it looked like I was putting my finger in my nose when I did that. <laughs> did you ever see that Seinfeld episode? Never mind. Okay. So here we have this chart of the ages that I like to use. And um, <clears throat> what we have here are all these different uh, time frames where God has worked with humanity. I mean, I'll slide over here. Can you see? All right. So we have the different ages in which he's worked, worked the age of innocence, conscience, human government, promise, law. And in these periods of time, God had been, was bringing people to the Messiah. Oh, there, lost it. That's okay. There we go. Thanks, Stephen. And they were looking forward to the cross. And in this period of time, particularly right here in the law, uh, during this period of time, God was sending prophets to Israel, mostly because his people had abandoned him for other uh, false gods. That's not right. Other false gods. That's indicating God's a false god. That's wrong. For other gods. And in doing so, God would tell the people, I'm going to punish you because you're abandoning me. And the punishment essentially was God scattered those people around the world. But every time a prophet would say to the people, look, repent, and if you don't, God's going to bring his judgment, and this is what's going to happen to you, God would normally turn around and say, but there's going to be a time where there's a Messiah who's going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom and he's going to restore you again. And so the people here in this time were looking forward to this time here. Oh, I can't get next to that speaker. To this time here, the kingdom. So there's going to be a thousand year reign where Christ is going to rule on the earth and he's going to demonstrate how man could rule the world as God originally intended. And so the prophets were looking for this point of time and that's what they were prophesying to. But what they couldn't see was this span of time right in here from Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, to the rapture of the church, there's a unique period of time, if you want to call it the church age, where there's a unique work that God is doing, where he's drawing men and women, boys and girls, to the Lord Jesus Christ, and he is building the church. Or a better way to put it is this. He is going after a bride for his son. And when we go to Genesis chapter 24, the mystery that Paul speaks about in Ephesians 
which is that particular unique time frame that we're living in right now for the last 2,000 years called the, the church age, Genesis 24 talks about that period of time. That's why we needed to start with Ephesians. It was a mystery to those people who lived in these Old Testament times. They couldn't see it. But in the, New, in the Old Testament, it was hinted at in various ways. And one of those ways is found in Genesis chapter 24. Now I want you to turn to Genesis 24 with me. Now we have spent three or four Sundays in, um, or three or four lessons, I should say, in Genesis 24. We've exegeted the passage completely and, and in context. And what I want to do this morning is I want to look at Genesis 24 from a little bit different light. In the Bible, um, you, you can find uh, certain things that we call in theological terms, typology. And what that is, is God will take at times and use a person or an event to be a kind of type or a kind of a person that is, that is foreshadowing something that's going to happen in the future. I'll give you an example. The Passover lamb in Exodus is a beautiful example. The Passover lamb is a type of Christ who's going to be sacrificed in the future. So in the, in the Old Testament, there are these types, or another way you might want to put it, are pictures that God gives us that's framed in the present reality of what was happening contextually at that time. But it's a picture of something he's going to do in the future. It's kind of like foreshadowing and you read a book, and some one line is there, and it's foreshadowing something. I love to look for that in movies. Whenever I'm watching a movie, the first 15, 20 minutes of the movie is really important to me because I'm listening, trying to figure out what are they foreshadowing here, see? And what we have in Genesis 24 is God foreshadowing the church age. And, and what God... God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were doing in the church age and what the bride is supposed to be doing. Now you'll know if you've been with me through these studies, we have Abraham here who um, is the father, we have Isaac who is the son, and we have the Holy Spirit who is the servant, and of course we have Rebecca who is the bride. We've got all four characters that take place in the church age. And in a nutshell, what we have is Abraham, who's a type of God the Father, who wants a, son, a, a bride for his son, so he sends his servant out. And the servant is a type of Holy Spirit, who goes out into the world to get a son, or get a bride for the son. And Isaac is a type of Christ who waits at home with the father until the servant brings the bride back. And Rebecca is a type of the church who has to decide to follow the servant or the Holy Spirit in order to get to the son. And so we have all this typology going on inside of Genesis 24 that is absolutely beautiful, because it exposes the nature of the Trinity and the responsibilities within the Trinity. Now, that's a subject that confuses a lot of people, the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Well, how does all that work, Pastor? Genesis 24 helps us to understand this a little bit, especially in terms of salvation and getting a bride for the bridegroom. So what I'm going to do this morning is we're going to look at each, each uh, one of these people, Abraham, compare him to the father, 
and what the Father is doing in the present age that we live in now, that church age that I showed you in the diagram, and what he's doing. And then we'll look at uh, Jesus, the son. We'll compare Isaac to him. And then we're going to compare the servant to the Holy Spirit. And then we'll compare Rebecca to the church, which is us. Okay? So the first thing I want to bring out to you, so we have four points to the sermon. Let me put it that way to you. Okay? And so I've entitled this, this little... Um, teaching this morning on Genesis 24, the foreshadowing of God's future plans. The foreshadowing of God's future plans. Four points to it. The first one is this. The plan of God the Father was to acquire a bride for his son. Now, we get this out of verses 1 through 8, and I'm not going to go back and read all these because, again, we've exegeted all these. But you know, if you were with me, that in verses 1 through 8, it's Abraham who's gotten up there in age, and he's realizing that the promises that God made to him need to be passed on to his son and to the generations that follow. And so he needs a bride for his son, and he puts a plan together for that bride. This is where he's at in life. And so um, Isaac is really the focus of his life. Uh, when you look at the story of Abraham, he wanted children. When he got Ishmael, he was all excited. That's his first son through Hagar. You remember that? But then the second son was the son of promise, Isaac. And when he got that son, he loved that boy, and life was centered around that boy. And as we come into chapter 24, the boy is not his God. But he realizes through the boy, who's now a man, probably 40 years old, this, this son of his needs a bride in order for the promises of God that were made to him would get passed on and eventually the Christ would come. And so in a very, very real sense, Isaac was the focus of his father's life. His son needed descendants in order to fulfill the requirement. Now, in Abraham, we have a picture of God the Father. Watch this. Just as Abraham's one thought was his son, God's one thought is his son, Jesus. And in him, God finds all the purposes and plans for everything fulfilled. I want you to notice how this is pictured concerning Abraham in verse 36. Look at verse 36. This is where the servant is telling the story about his master. In verse 36 now Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master in her old age, and he has given him all that he has. Now that's an important statement. It's that statement is saying that Abraham, while he was still alive, was investing everything he had into his son. His son was getting it all and had received it. And it's interesting. What does the New Testament tell us about God the Father's desire for his son? Listen to this. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, God the Father called his kingdom the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, in Genesis 30, uh, 24, 36, Abraham gives his kingdom over to his son. God, in Colossians chapter 1, says, my kingdom is the kingdom of my beloved son. In a sense, he's renaming his kingdom. 
It's my beloved son's kingdom. God the Father has given his kingdom in total to his son, Jesus. A spotlight is put on this fact when the Apostle Paul wrote a letter to the church in Ephesus. In, Eph- in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 20, Paul makes uh, a point that really drives this home for us. Galatians, there we go. Ephesians chapter 1. And the key verses there are 20 through 22. I'll start in 15 to give us some context here. Paul says to these Ephesians, For this reason I too, having heard of the faith of the Lord Jesus which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that God, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. Now, I want you to notice, if you like drawing lines in your Bible, starting in verse 17, he identifies God as the father of glory. And every time you see a hymn after that, for instance, in the bottom of verse 17, revelation in the knowledge of him, I pray that your eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance, what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards those who believe these are in accordance with the working of the power of his might. That's all talking about God the Father. Now watch, there's a shift that takes place, which he, God the Father, brought about in Christ when he, God the Father, raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, all authority and power and dominion and every name that is, that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Listen, everything God the Father does is for the benefit of his son's majesty, glory, and exaltation. In Jesus Christ, the totality of God, the Father's plans and purposes were, are, and will forever be intrinsically engrossed in his Son. This places God the Son above everyone and everything, or as Paul put it in Philippians to the believers, God highly exalted Christ and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Just as Abraham's focus was on his son, God the Father's focus is on his son, Jesus Christ. There's nothing else that drives him more passionately than his son. Secondly, the singular purpose of Abraham in Genesis 24 was to find a bride for his son. The singular purpose in this present age, the church age, is for God the Father to find a bride for his son. There are a few passages in the New Testament that highlight this. For instance, in Matthew 22, verse 2, Jesus tells a story there of a king who prepared a marriage for his son. And the story pictures God the Father and how he prepares a wedding for his son. And this is... This is really highlighted in Young's translation. It's a a literal translation of the Bible. Listen to how this verse pops for us. Matthew 22, 2. The reign of the heavens was likened to a man 
who made, who made marriage feast for his son. That's a literal translation. It's more of a word-for-word -word translation. The reign of the heavens was likened to a man, a king, who made marriage feast for his son. Now, it's kind of hard to get, but if you stop and think about it, what Jesus is saying is, this is a father who has arranged a wedding for his son. And in the story, the father in that wedding, the king, is representing God the father. And so it's God the Father who is arranging this wedding for his son. In a certain kind of sense, you could say that the Father is a wedding coordinator. God the Father is a wedding coordinator for Jesus, his son. And I think this is further emphasized in verse 11 when the king came in to look at the wedding guest. He knew who was and who wasn't supposed to be there by the way that they were dressed. It's interesting. The bridegroom doesn't come in and look over the guest. It is the king. It's the father of the bride. And the father is going through the guests that are there at this wedding, and he's saying, ah, you don't belong here. you got to leave. Okay, you're, you're here. Good, good, good. No, nope, you don't belong here. He knew everyone that was supposed to be present. And the story emphasizes how the Father, God the Father, preparing a wedding for his son, just as Abraham did for Isaac. Secondly, we find in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, a series of verses where Jesus emphatically affirms that God, his Father, chose the bride for him. John chapter 6. Now, I know that verses like this really rub some people the wrong way. Before, before you get your, the hair back up on your neck, just relax a little bit, and let me get through everything this morning, and you'll see a balance in all of this, okay? But there's a couple of verses here that I want to point out to you. First of all, verse 37, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me shall come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. Notice here also verse 39, and this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. And then verse 44 no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on, this la on the last day. And then verse 65, and he was saying, For this reason I have, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. The point is this. Nobody comes to Jesus apart from the Father drawing them, period. And so just as Abraham sent his servant to go get a bride, there's a particular bride. We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But there, is a, there are particulars where God has reached out and God has chosen those that would be a part of the bride. Thirdly, in Jesus' high priestly prayer found in John 17, we find him covering, uh, actually communing with God, the Father, about the bride the Father has chosen for him. So, chapter 17, verse 2, first of all, Again, for context, I'll just start at one. These things Jesus spoke, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, Father, the hour has come, glorify thy Son, that the Son may glory, glorify thee. Even as thou hast given him authority over all mankind, that to all whom thou hast given him, he may give eternal life. 
And then verse 6, I manifested thy name to the men whom thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them to me, and they have kept thy word. So these men that he's referring to here are the disciples, his disciples. It's interesting here that they were gods before they were Jesus. God the Father is before the Son in that sense of the Father choosing. We also want to note here, verse 9, I ask on their behalf, I do not ask on behalf of the world, but of those whom thou hast given me, for they are thine. And then verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me for thou didst love me before the foundation of the world. Notice again in verse 24, whom thou hast given me. Now you have to, you have to go up a few verses here where Jesus says in verse 20, he says, I do not ask in behalf of those alone, referring to his disciples, watch this, but for those also who believe in me through their word. So here Jesus is praying for the whole body of Christ. He begins praying for the, the disciples and that relationship, identifying them as the ones that God has chosen to be a part of the church, a part of his bride. And then gears get switched in this prayer, and now he's praying for all those who would come to know him and be a part of the church. And these are the ones that God has chosen. Now one may ask, why is God going after a bride for his son? And I think that's a good question. And the answer is simply this. When Israel rejected her Messiah, God set his relationship with them on the back burner and he brings to the front burner a brand new work he's doing called the church. And this is a, a new breed of people. Peter talks about these people in 1 Peter chapter uh, 2. Speaking to the church, he says, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. Now that's a quote out of the Old Testament where God is speaking to Israel. But now Peter turns around and he says, This can be used to the church because God the Father is drawing out a people who will become the bride for his son. And it's a unique people. A chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And so this is why, this is why God is raising up a bride for his son, because Israel rejected his son. God says, fine, I'm going to put you on the back burner. Now I'm going to bring these people forward, and we're going to do something so unique. I hinted at it in the Old Testament, and now I'm bringing it about as we move forward into the New Testament. And so, there's something else I want to bring to you regarding the Father here. And I want uh, to point this out to you. When Abraham put his plan together, he sent his servant for the bride. And the bride didn't even know it. She had no idea that she was on Abraham's mind. And it's interesting that as God sends his spirit into the world, he's coming after those that he has chosen before the foundation of the world. And that's what we're told in the book of Ephesians, chapter 1. Starting at verse 3, we read this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. God the Father 
had his focus on the bride before the bride ever knew it. He was loving you before the foundation of the world. He knew you, was thinking about you, pursuing you. You, if you are in Christ, if you are born again, he was coming after you to be his son's bride. Now, how precious is that? When you think about what Abraham was doing and how special Rebecca was to Isaac because the father went after her, that's exactly what God the Father has done in this present age with the church. He is coming after you with a specific purpose to be his son's bride. Now that's an amazing thing. And it is a precious thing. And I thank God for it. Now that's the work of God the Father in a nutshell out of Genesis 24. But now we turn to the Son. The work of God the Son in this chapter is unique. His work was this, waiting. In verses 62 through 67, Isaac comes on the scene. And uh, we picture him there in a field. He's meditating, praying. What's interesting is we haven't seen or heard from Isaac since Genesis chapter 22. You remember what happened in 22? That's where Isaac was taken up on the mountain by his father, laid on the altar, and was going to be sacrificed for his father. Remember that? And in the midst of it, God stops Abraham from killing his son. But there is another one of those typologies for us, isn't it? Because in that whole sacrifice, we see a picture of Abraham, again, God the Father, sacrificing his son, Isaac, in that God the Father sacrificed his son, Jesus, at the cross of Calvary. Well, that's the last time we heard of him. Now we move fast forward to 24, and where do we find the son now? The son's in the field meditating, and he's waiting for his bride. It's a powerful correlation. The second thing that we want to notice in this is this. In chapter 24, um, Isaac was not static in his waiting. Uh, while he was waiting, he was praying, and he was preparing his mother's tent for his bride. And here we see the comparison to Jesus. Just prior to his crucifixion, he told his disciples that he was going away and that he was going to prepare a place for them in his father's house. John 14, verses 2 and 3. In my father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. For 2,000 years, Jesus has been preparing a home for you and I, for his bride, for the church. And that's what Isaac was doing. Remember that when he met his bride, what, what did he do with her? He took her into his mother's tent. And she had died three years previous to that. He knew if a bride was coming, she needed a place to live. You don't bring a bride home and, and there's nothing there. How many of you have ever seen the, the movie Seven Brides for Seven Brothers? Some of you have. It's a great classic. You should get it on Netflix or something. You know, my girls just love that. It's a real chick flick. Um, <laughs> um, but I enjoyed it too. I remember watching it as a little boy. But one of the things happened, this guy goes off to town. He gets himself a bride, kind of tricks her, brings her back to the homestead. And here he's got like all these brothers and they live like pigs. 
you know, and she's got, on the way, she's, you can see she's riding in the wagon on the, it's kind of a Western thing, on the wagon coming back to the house, and she's got grand visions on what everything's going to be, you know, when she gets there, she gets there, the house is dilapidated, all these brothers, you know, they don't pick up after themselves, there's laundry there for months, the dishes haven't been done, it's just a dirty pigsty, and she walks in, this happy bride, and looks at this and goes, Wow. No decent man does that to his bride. What he wants to do is he wants to prepare a beautiful place to, to bring her to, some place that she can call her own and make her own home and nest there. And that's what Isaac was doing. That's what Jesus is doing for us. That is a glorious picture. Think about it. The God who spoke the world into existence whom the psalmist says that is just um, tinker toys, playing with tinker toys for him, has been for 2,000 years preparing a place for you. What do you think that place is going to be like when you get there? I think it's going to be pretty special. Now, there's another thing we need to mention here about Isaac and that he was praying prior to the bride getting there. He was meditating in the field, praying for his bride is one of the main ministries that Jesus has in heaven as he waits for his bride. Listen to what Hebrews 7.25 says, Hence also he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is praying for you today. Your bridegroom has you on his mind and he is praying for you. Someone says, how could one man do that? He's God. (laughs) He knows all things. He's everywhere present. He's not confined anymore to this human body. He's God. And he makes intercession for you. Imagine, imagine you, you measly pile of mud. (laughs) That this glorious Savior would have you on his mind today, interceding for you when the temptations are coming. When you're in a hospital room and the doctor says, there's nothing more I can do for your sister. When someone whispers in your ear, hey, this would be fun if we go over here and get loaded and do some things that we shouldn't be doing. He's interceding for you. When you call upon him for help, oh, Jesus, help me. Don't you see what I'm going through? Jesus is interceding for you. Along with this verse here, the Apostle John tells us that Jesus is serving us as our advocate before the Father as he is waiting for us. In John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, I'm writing, writing these things to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a lawyer in heaven who's speaking up for us when Satan comes before God and says, ah, did you see them? When the accuser points at us and says, look at his failures, look at her failures. We have an advocate, a lawyer in heaven. I really like the way John highlights the Son of God with this title, Jesus Christ the Righteous. If you've ever seen the movie True Grit, you know that there's a young girl in the movie And she's about 14, a very precocious 14-year-old named Maddie Ross. And she likes to intimidate adults. And her task, her quest in the movie is that her father was murdered. She wants to go back and get his body, return it home, but she wants his murderer found. And so she's always trying to get these adults to help her. And when an adult just kind of blows her off or, or... 
it seems like he's trying to play games with her, she turns around and she threatens him with the lawyer's name, J. Noble Daggett. As if they have, were supposed to have heard that name and be intimidated. My lawyer, J. Noble Daggett, will be getting a hold of you. Oh, fear. That's sort of the thing that John's bringing forth here when he says of Jesus, our advocate, Jesus Christ the righteous. This isn't just anybody coming before the Father. It's not an angel. This is Jesus Christ the righteous. Whoa. This is some kind of person. This is God Almighty. And oh, by the way, he's my husband. Now that sounds weird in our culture today, but you understand what I'm talking about, don't you? If you're born again, you're, you're his bride. He's my husband. That's who's defending me. Jesus Christ the righteous. And one last thing that we should mention here is how when the servant delivered the bride, he sat down with Isaac. You remember that? And he told him the whole story about this bride so that Isaac could be affirmed. This was God's working here. And one day, one day the, the Holy Spirit will take us before the son at the Bema seat. And it struck me as I was reading this and because I'm teaching on Tuesdays about the end times and we've talked a lot about the Bema seat, it struck me that when we get there, perhaps the Holy Spirit will sit down with God the Son and say, well, I want to talk to you about your servant Dan. Uh, this is what he did and didn't do. And based on the Spirit's testimony of what I did and didn't do, I will either gain or lose rewards. That's, a, that's an interesting concept there, isn't it? You ever wonder, how's Jesus going to know everything that I did and if I walked with the Spirit or not? Oh, all he's got to do is talk to the Spirit. And so just as Isaac sat down with the servant to discover who this gal was that was coming before him to be his bride, I think the Spirit of God will sit down with God the Son and they'll have a talk about each one of us individually and based on the Spirit's testimony of our lives of walking with Him, the Son then will judge what things we will lose and what things we'll be rewarded for. It's a glorious picture of Jesus here as He now is in heaven waiting for His bride patiently. And I would add that as sort of a last caveat if you think about it. Isaac waited patiently at home with his father. He didn't say, Dad, I, I, I'm going to go with the servant. I want to find out what she really looks like. <laughs> no, he stayed home. The father sent the servant. And he patiently waited. And that's showing obedience to the father. And of course, the son, Jesus, is in perfect obedience to the father. The third person here is God, the Holy Spirit. And what we find here in verses 5 through 66 is this servant acquiring a bride for God's Son. And this is what the Holy Spirit is doing in this present age that we live in. He's acquiring a bride for his Son. And as we noted over and over again in our exegesis of chapter 24, the servant of Abraham was an incredibly faithful servant who loved his master and his master's son. In the servant, we have a picture of God the Holy Spirit and his ministry in the church age. He's sent into the world. He loves the father and he loves the son. It's, it's really emphasizing the, the love within the Trinity. And it is the Spirit's responsibility to go into the world and get this bride. And I want to show you six responsibilities of the Holy Spirit. I'll fire through them in rapid fire because I'm certainly out of time. But I want to show you six responsibilities of the Holy Spirit in his ministry during the church age and how this is foreshadowed for us in chapter 24. First of all, Abraham's servant, his responsibility was to find a bride for his master's son. We see this in verse 4. 
In this present age, the responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to find a bride for his son. Now, the way he goes about this is to bring people to faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. The means by which he fulfills this responsibility can really be condensed into two factors. Number one, he brings about a conviction of sin, and specifically in regards to who Jesus is. John 16, John chapter 16. Jesus said this as he's getting ready to leave his disciples, but I tell you the truth, it is for your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, he's referring to the Holy Spirit, referring to the Holy Spirit. We've really struggled with this. And suddenly one day it's just like, you know, I really believe that's true, that Jesus is the Christ for his master The Holy Spirit does the same for God the Father. Number two, Abraham's servant was responsible to find a specific individual. We note this in verses 4 and 14. In the church age, the Holy Spirit is is responsible to find the individuals that God the Father has chosen. People are saved one person at a time. We all need to know that. The Bible records times when thousands of people have come to the Lord and even where whole families have come to know Christ as their Savior. But each person has to make a decision to trust in, cling to, and rely upon Jesus to be their Savior. No one is born again by simply being associated with a certain group or because they were born into a certain family. The Holy Spirit goes after one person at a time. And the reason for this is due to the fact that the Holy Spirit is going after those people who have been specifically chosen by God the Father before the foundation of the world, which we talked about already. Jesus told people that they were following, um, that they were following him. Jesus told people that, that were following him that um, man comes to the uh, Father only by the Father drawing them. And this is what um, the Spirit is doing. He's looking for the individuals that the Father has reached out and chosen before the foundation of the world to bring them into the church. Number three, Abraham's servant was responsible to present his master's son, not himself. And we see this in verses 34 through 40. He goes and tells the whole story to, um, to Rebecca and her family about Abraham and his son. He never, ever talks about himself. It's interesting that Jesus clarified the ministry of the Holy Spirit when he said that he would not speak on his own initiative in John chapter 16 and 15. Um, And that leaves us, you know, in Genesis 24, kind of speculating, well, who is this servant? Well, it's Eleazar, is what most people would say, but we don't know for sure. He never gives his name. But it's interesting that, again, in Jesus' ministry, just prior to him leaving, he said, I'm going to send the Spirit, but he will only speak of what I tell him. He's only concerned is to present Christ. And that's what he's doing in this present age. That is the emphasis for him, to exalt the Lord Jesus. And I would say this to you. If you've ever been a part of a group where they're all excited, or some church is all excited about the Holy Spirit and what the Spirit is doing, and they're just talking about the Spirit, yaddy, 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 the Spirit's doing this and the Spirit's doing that, run, 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 run. Because the Spirit never puts himself front and center. He always puts Jesus front at the front, always exalts Christ, and he's in the background. Just saying. Number four, Abraham's servant was responsible to bring the girl to the point of making a decision. 
We see this in verse 8, 39 through 41, 49, and 58. He's always pressing the point. And when, it, when push gets to, uh, to shove, uh, he puts it right, they put it right to Rebecca. There's a decision you have to make. And the responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to help people to get to the point of decision making about Jesus. In this picture, really what we see is how the bride had to make a decision. God, let me put it this way, the servant didn't grab her by the hair and drag her back to the son. And God never deals like that with people when it comes to salvation. He doesn't force or shove people into salvation. People have to make the decision. The Bible tells us that whoever believes in Christ should not perish, but have eternal life. The, for, the whoever believes are those who applied the offer of salvation. Here's the offer. The whoever are the ones who reach out and say, yes, I'll go. And the Spirit's job, his responsibility is to draw people along and bring them to the point where they say, yes, I want that. The decision that's made is not solely an act of human will, though. It's interesting that uh, in John makes this point really straightforwardly in the beginning of his gospel, where he says, and I'm almost there, where he says this, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. People are born again because God does the work. But somewhere in that work, he allows in this microcosm moment us to say, yes, I want that. But I wouldn't say, yes, I want that unless the Spirit of God came on me, upon me, and helped me to see and want these things. And so it's God working in conjunction with his will and my will to bring me to the point where I say, yes, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And some would, would tell you today, well, no, it's all one-sided. You don't have nothing to do with it at all. And that's true, but they're pushing it to an extreme. I don't have time to go into that. Number five, Abraham's servant was responsible to bring presents to the bride. The Holy Spirit is responsible to give gifts to the bride of Christ. The custom of that day was for the bridegroom's father to bring gifts to the bride so that they would know they have the means to care for her. And when the Holy Spirit comes to the individual and brings them along and there is this born again moment it's the spirit of god that's working and it's the spirit of god that's giving out gifts in two fashions first it's the gift of salvation it's the gift of salvation which paul talks about in ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 he says it is the gift of god and it's the Spirit of God that works that out in our lives. Secondly, spiritual gifts are given to the individual for the body of Christ. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 through 11. So there's, there's essentially two, two different kinds of gifts. One for salvation, another spiritual gifts are given to the individual for the building up of the body of Christ. Sixth. Abraham's servant was responsible to bring the bride safely to his master's son. And we see in verses 61 through 65, that's what took place. The responsibility of the Holy Spirit is to bring the bride of Christ safely to him. This is really the last responsibility of the Spirit in terms of his duties to the church to bring the bride safely home to the bridegroom. This is emphasized for us in many places, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, where we're told that the Spirit is our seal and the pledge of God to the, the, to the uh, finishing of our redemption. And so the Spirit of God also is going to be taken out of the world at some point. Uh, Paul talks about that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, 
verses 6, 7, 8, 9, right in there. And, he, and the Spirit's going to be taken out. Well, Jesus told his disciples that when the Spirit comes, he's never going to leave you. So when the Spirit leaves, guess who's leaving with him? So when Jesus says, come up to the church in the rapture, it's the Spirit of God that grabs the, the church and says, let's go. Let's go. So there you have the responsibilities of God, the Holy Spirit. And lastly, you have the response of the bride to, lead, uh, to follow the leading of the, of the Spirit. And just like Rebecca had to follow the servant to get to the Son, we have to follow the Spirit in order to get to the Son. Individually and corporately, it is essential that the bride walk with the Spirit. And that's why in Galatians 5.16, Paul said, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Furthermore, when you go into uh, Galatians, uh, Galatians chapter 5, when you get to verse uh, 25 there, um, there's this, this emphasis here uh, of responsibility to walk with the Spirit. And that, what that means is, is that you're sensitive to his moving. You go where he wants to go, the next step you take. And it's interesting, in verse 25, that's exactly what it brings out in the Greek. It says, walk in the Spirit. It's to take the next step. Taking the next step. Every step is a walk with the Spirit. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it's designed. Rebecca could have never found Abraham if it wasn't for the Spirit. She had to follow the Spirit back to Abraham and Isaac. And it is interesting that corporately, the call to walk by the Spirit has ramifications on the body of Christ. Just very quickly, and I'm going to be ending on this, in Ephesians uh, chapter, um, chapter 5, Paul uh, to understand that God, while working with Abraham to build a nation, had bigger plans than just one nation. God has a heart big enough to love the whole world, and he was thinking of us long before the reality of Genesis 24 was ever a blimp on the radar screen of life. And this chapter helps us to see this. Another thing that pre that's presented to us here is this that if these kinds of nuggets are tucked away in chapter 24, and we can see through the unpacking of the rest of the New Testament, these truths that are coming forward there, doesn't that speak to us about the veracity of God's word? It's things like this that cause me to go, you know, this really is the word of God. Because Moses didn't just think of this and come up with this on his own. But it's as Peter said, but know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will. But men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And so when you see passages like this, and this typology comes out of it, this becomes rich, rich ground for building my faith in the Word of God. So there you have chapter 24. We've exegeted it. We've seen the typology in it. And as we conclude it, we finished half the book of Genesis. The next time we come together, we'll be in chapter 25. And it's the closing of an era. It'll be the closing of Abraham's life and the baton of the covenant that God established with him will be passed on to Isaac. And along the way, we're going to meet some very important people that are going to help us to see how God was working in the life of stubborn people to get his plans and his will accomplished, to build a nation. And from that nation comes this man called Jesus who is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It's a great story. Let's pray. Father, I pray this morning that the Spirit of the living God 
would take the things that we've sought to understand and make those things real to us and apply those things to our lives where we need it individually. How encouraging, Father, it is to know that you know us individually, not just as a, a big group of people, and somehow we're lost in a sea of people. But you knew us individually before the foundation of the world, and you loved us in Christ, and you planned and purposed for us to be his bride. My goodness, we are unique. We are privileged. What a blessing for eternity to be on display as the bride of Christ. What a connection we have with you through him. And Lord, the work of the Spirit in our lives, these things need to be thought of more than just the little time that we spent on this today. We've only scratched the surface. And so I want to ask that this next week, you would cause these passages and the thoughts that I've brought to the church to, to swell up inside of them and, and cause that to be food that they eat on this next week. For Lord, if we just come to church and open our Bibles and close them and walk out the doors with no thought of the things that we've learned and no application to our lives, what use is it to us? Our lives become noisy gongs. And Jesus becomes less to us than what he ought to be. Oh God, don't allow that to happen to us. Help us to exalt Christ in our lives as our great bridegroom who awaits us. And Lord, help us to fall in love with the working of his spirit within us and the ministry he has for us. Oh, I thank you for his love for us. Thank you for his compassion towards us. Thank you for his consistency in dwelling us. And thank you for the assurance in him that one day our, our great salvation will be completed. Because he has done a great work and is doing a great work in our lives. So many wonderful things here. And we praise you and thank you for them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you next week. Two weeks, yeah, not next week. Yeah, yeah, see me. Lord willing and the creeks don't rise.